Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our um, seminar today. And today is our great pleasure to have Dr. Matt um, Rudell with us. So Dr. Rudell is uh, Associate um, Deputy Director for the Hydrosphere, Biosphere, and Geophysics, um, which comprise about um, 400 scientists and engineers um, within the Earth Science Division and NASA gather. And prior um, to then, he was a uh, um, research scientist in the hydrological science laboratory from um, 2001 to 2012, and the chief of the NAMP from um, 2012 to 2019. So Dr. Rodell is a member of the science team for NASA's uh, Greece mission um, and Greece follow-on. He needs the uh, uh, global land data assimilation system and, and other projects focused on monitoring groundwater storage changes, mapping and forecasting drought wetness, and detecting climate-related variation in the water cycle. He is a past associate editor for the Journal of Hydrology and a current editor for the Journal of Hydrometeorology. He has chaired the hydro hydrology program for the AGU for meeting and led various national and international scientific working groups. He received a presidential early career award for scientist and engineer in 2006 and a NASA Gather Earth Science Achievement Award in 2007 a Robert Gather Award for Exceptional Achievement in Science in uh, 2011, and an Arthur Fleming Award for Outstanding Federal Service in the area of basic science in 2015. He has more than uh, 130 peer-reviewed publications, and he appeared um, on Clavery's analytics um, highly cited researchers in um, in the past two years. Um, he received um, a BS in environment science from the College of William and Mary and a PhD from, uh, in geological science from uh, UT Austin. So let's welcome the speaker. Thanks. Am I on? All right, good. Okay, well, thank you for that, uh, that introduction. Um, hope everyone's still awake after uh, this. Uh, so I'm going to talk about global groundwater variability uh, in the 21st century, uh, based on observations, and then looking at some expectations and uh, and forecasts. And um, uh, I know you just had to sit through that that bio, you know biography, but um, let me just give you a little bit of another one because whenever I talk to students, I, I think I think students are interested in you know how where am I going to go from here, and and it's important to realize that career paths can go. Crazy ways. So, so I started out. I grew up in in Connecticut. Um, I was always outside. Uh, this is before cell phones, and um, I spent a lot of time just out in the woods, just doing whatever, burning leaves and stuff. And, um, and uh, then I went to William and Mary, which is in Virginia. I started out as as a math major, and I was pre med. Um, soon found out I wasn't very good at chemistry, so the, the pre med thing went out the window. And I ultimately switched to environmental science. Had a lot of um, geology classes involved in it. I met my wife in one of those geology classes. Um, and my favorite courses were uh, environmental geology and hydrogeology. And I and there's the same teacher for both of those. Who was a fantastic teacher and sort of a mentor. And he actually helped me get my first job. I was working for Environmental Management Services in New Jersey, which is a uh, consulting firm. And my job was basically driving to all the Hess gas stations in New Jersey and taking water samples. If you ever been to a gas station, you see these little these little uh, manhole covers about that big, dotting, especially if it's an older station. A lot of times, what that is 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 if they have an if it's an older station, they have an underground storage tank for their gasoline. The older tanks, you know, if they're 30, 40 years old, were made out of you know a, a single walled steel tank. And you can imagine over time, the thing sitting underground, things start to disintegrate, and then you start to have um, leaking um, gasoline uh, getting into the soil and, and into the aquifer. So what we would do is we would we would um, we'd put these wells in and take samples in the wells and try to map this plume of contamination 
And as long as the, the contaminated plume was staying on the site, they were good. They didn't care, you know, just staying on site. The state didn't make them do anything about it. But once it started, started flowing towards the edge, then we had to install uh, remediation systems. Um, so anyway, I was the guy to go out and take the samples. I took cones out and stopped the cars. or trying to get gas and take my samples and bring them to the lab. And uh, a lot of time outside, it wasn't, wasn't the greatest job. It was, it was interesting, but I was happy to get back to grad school after doing that for a year. And I think that really um, uh, helped me to, to appreciate um, being in class and going to class and, and taking it seriously. Uh, so, so that was at uh, University of Texas at Austin. I thought I was going to do this contaminant hydrogeology, but um, my supervisor, Jay Familietti, uh, steered me towards um, uh, large-scale hydrology and remote sensing. Um, and I ended up doing a pre-launch study on the GRACE mission, which was, um, just, it was just serendipity that the GRACE mission PI was, was at the University of Texas. Uh, so Jay and I sort of got the inside scoop on what was going on with that. And I, I did this pre-launch study. It was a bit risky because, you know, didn't know whether GRACE would ultimately be approved and whether, you know, whether it would launch and, and actually work. There were a lot of people who thought that, um, if, you know, in the Jazzy community thought that Grace was going to make a laughing stock of their community because they thought it wasn't going to work. Um, but Grace launched successfully, 2002, worked great, and um, and that sort of set me up for uh, for my research career. Um, so I went to NASA Goddard in 2000. Uh, originally, I worked for the Maryland Baltimore County, and then I got my uh, my government position in 2001. Been there ever since. Um, I've done. A little bit more and more management over time, um, but uh, but I still find time for science. I mean, the science is what gets me out of bed, and that's that's the exciting part for me. Okay, so um, so let's talk about uh, a groundwater storage variability to begin with. So so uh, so groundwater is um, as you know, it's the water that's underground stored in aquifers. How does it get there? You know, rain falls, some of that water um, infiltrates into the soil and, and eventually makes it down, percolates down to the water table. Um, so there's a bit of a um, there's a bit of a, uh, a, a sort of a, a, a filter or a um, insulation between the atmosphere where the action is and things are ha happening quickly and, and groundwater. And you can see this represented in this famous figure by, um, by uh, Stanley Chanion on the on the left here. You see these precipitation anomalies happen pretty quickly and that um, manifests itself in runoff anomalies and then the soil moisture changes a little more slowly and then the downstream River discharge is, is sort of delayed and see this lagged effect. Um, and then groundwater has, uh, has smaller variability, but, but ultimately is, uh, is um, reacting to uh, sort of integrated long-term hydrometeorological conditions. And you can see this in, this, in this, um, this time series here. So this is an actual time series from Illinois. Um, it's one of the few places in the world where we actually have good observations of groundwater, soil moisture, snow, and surface waters. We can sort of compare, um, you know, compare them over a large scale. If you average over the entire state, um, this is what it looks like. So these are these are this is water storage in millimeters on the y-axis here, and uh, the numbers are sort of um, arbitrary. Zero doesn't really mean anything, um, but the point here is that the blue is the groundwater, uh, the red is soil moisture, and then the white is is uh, snow. So in Illinois. You know, snow is a pretty small component. The, the surface water storage is actually an even smaller component of, of this total pressure of water storage change, we call this. Um, but you can see that what's important here is that the, the groundwater does change over time. And it does um, not only have sort of a seasonal cycle that you can see, but there's also interannual variability. This is a major drought here. Definition of groundwater? Yeah. Well, it's, it's water that, that actually reaches uh, the water table with a saturated zone. Um, but there's also, there's deeper confined groundwater, which means there's a, a confining bed like a layer, of, um, a layer of clay, for example, where water doesn't penetrate very quickly and sort of holds the water underneath, sometimes under pressure. It can be a lot of different depths. So in, in this part of the world, in, in, uh, in Illinois, it's pretty shallow. They get a lot of rainfall, the water table, you know, in some places, well, you know, if you come to a stream, that's basically, or a stream or a surface water, uh, you know, that, that's basically where the water table meets the topography, right? So it's very shallow there. Um, 
Other places, you know, you go up, up on a hill, the water table is probably going to be deeper. Um, so it varies in depth quite a bit. But you know, so in Illinois, it might be you know a couple meters under the ground. Same thing in um, you know in, in parts of Maryland, it can be shallow like that. And my we have a well in my yard. You know, our, we get our water from a well, and uh, and that well is I think um, 150 feet deep. Uh, in the water, we hit the water at about um, 50 to 100 feet. Um, so, so point here is I just want to point out that that the the groundwater does sort of vary over time here, and this is interesting because there are a lot of people who sort of made the assumption that groundwater never never changes, and from year to year there's no change in the groundwater. It's not really true. Um, it's actually one of the most variable components of uh, of this terrestrial water storage, which is the sum of all these these variables. And I'll talk more about that later. So um, this is going to show you how. Uh, Precipitation and soil moisture vary. So the precipitation, this is coming from the, um, the GPM satellite. The precipitation is showing the warm colors. Obviously, this is sped up. You can see the time down here in the lower right. And when a, one of these precipitation systems goes over um, Australia, you can see how it sort of paints the surface, and the blues are the soil moisture, uh, sort of paints the, soil, uh, the, the surface with this wetness. And then over time, there's evaporation, and, and, uh, and it dries out again. Um, but we move on to look at how groundwater compares to that soil moisture. It's even uh, sort of slowed down even more. So this is a results from a data simulating model, um, and the uh, the soil moisture shown on the left, and you can see that it changes pretty quickly. the The time scale down here is a little hard to see, but this is zooming through like months would be like one, two, three, four, five, six. So we're going through months pretty quickly here, but Soil moisture is evolving pretty quickly over time. And then the groundwater, the shallow groundwater, um, you can see that it's correlated with the soil moisture, um, but it moves even, sort of evolves even more slowly. And it gets through these blobs of wetness that, that evolve over time, and maybe they move a little bit. And then you start to get a dry period coming through, and they sl the blue sl slowly goes away, and then you get red. This is a major drought in Texas that happened in 2011, right about there. Um, and then in 2012, you see the whole U.S. Uh, become pretty dry. Actually, we're already past that. So, um, so point being, again, groundwater sort of changes more slowly, but it's sort of a um, sort of a subdued, um, uh, integrated uh, uh, accounting of what's been happening near the surface in terms of um, hydrometeorology. Um, groundwater again changes more slowly than the other near surface components of terrestrial water storage. It also has a large variability, just because there's the groundwater table can move up and down quite a bit. Um, whereas soil moisture, if you think about soil moisture in the upper few meters or in the root zone, you know, there's a limited amount of drying that can happen. There's a little amount of storage. Over long periods, groundwater can change a lot. Um, and for these reasons, groundwater is likely to be a good indicator of, of climate change. OK, so how is uh, groundwater? Um, predicted or anticipated to change in the future uh, with climate change. Let, let's first look at uh, predictions of precipitation. So this is from the, the, the 2013 IPCC report. Um, this is showing uh, predicted changes in precipitation for four different scenarios. Uh, the scenarios are shown in the upper right here. It's a little hard to see, but basically we have the, uh, the low end scenario, which is shown in the upper left. Is, is if we're really good at converting to renewables, we reduce our, our uh, you know, not pumping as much CO2 and methane into the atmosphere, and we're able to get a handle on, on global warming and, and basically maximize, you know, we hit a maximum um, CO2 content in the atmosphere by around 2040. Um, then you have the high end scenario in the lower right, which is, which is more or less business as usual. CO2 continues to go up. Um, an accelerated rate, and uh, you know that's basically if we do nothing, we continue to burn fossil fuels, and by the end of the century, uh, this is what you get. So, um, so they're all. You can see that they're all pretty well correlated in terms of um, where different positive and negative trends are happening. So, if you look at the uh, the bottom right here, the the high end scenario, you see they're sort of winners and losers. You can think of it as so. There are, there are regions like southwestern U.S. A lot of people like to retire, and that's predicted to get drier and drier. They already have scarce water resources. But then there are parts of 
you know, parts of Africa that, that see a, a gain in precipitation, they might be saying, hey, this, this is a pretty good thing. Um, so, so how is this going to affect groundwater? So there are a lot of different things to, to consider in terms of the, the groundwater impacts. One is that um, you have a warmer climate, you're expected to have more uh, evapotranspiration, right? There's more, more, uh, more energy near the surface to, to, to drive the evapotranspiration, so you're going to lose more water from the surface. This results in less water being available to, to recharge uh, the aquifers. At the same time, you might be relying more on, on, um, on irrigation. So if that irrigation comes from, um, from a surface water source, then there might be more water applied to the land that will then uh, uh, percolate down and, and recharge uh, the aquifer. Um, if there's groundwater extractions, you might expect, expect um, that that's going to cause more uh, uh, saline um, intrusion from the, from the oceans. Um, and there are other, other issues to consider. So this is just one, one person or one paper's um, sort of, uh, uh, prediction of what's going to happen. This is another one um, from Tom Meixner at the University of Arizona looking at the uh, uh, the western U.S., uh, where predictions would be for things like uh, less snowpack with global warming. Less snowpack, there might be actually more, more precipitate, more rainfall and less snowfall. Uh, the rainfall is going to run off more quickly, so you might have more, um, more infiltration to, to groundwater, more recharge along the rivers. Um, but at the same time, you're going to have less of this sort of slow um, diffuse recharge where you're having where there would be uh, snow melt and and, um, and and stream flow. So uh, so a lot of things to think about, a lot of different impacts. Uh, this is one recent study just came out uh, this year by uh, Laura Condon um, at Colorado School of Mines, and uh, uh, this is showing that there's um, if you took that high end scenario and had a four degree C warming about 100 years from now. Yeah, they run their model with, uh, with recharge and model how the, how, the, um, how the groundwater responds. And over the course of four years, uh, these are the storage differences in the groundwater that they predict. So this is, uh, this is millimeters. Some of these places uh, in the Midwest, Midwestern US you know, could be up to 100 millimeters of, of groundwater loss uh, just over the course of, of four years um, related to uh, basically related to evapotranspiration decreases. Um, so of course, uh, you know, climate change is not the only impact on, uh, on groundwater. One of the other big ones is, is uh, human water consumption. And so this is a study that came out um, about 10 years ago. Uh, Yoshi Haidwada et al. Um, made some predictions, or actually not, not predictions. This is looking at available data, ground-based data, what's been happening in these major aquifers around the world um, up until the year 2000. And there are regions like, um, like northern India, where there's been severe depletion, uh, also in uh, North China Plain. And uh, they also have some predictions for, um, for this is top line here is, is total water demand. Um, this goes from 1960 to 2000. Um, so global water demand increased during that period. Also, it increases in, uh, in global groundwater demand. You know, a large part of this total water demand is made up for by groundwater demand. Um, this is the, the groundwater um, abstractions um, during that period. Um, actually, sorry, this is groundwater depletion. Um, this is all sort of relative to a uh, uh, some, um, I guess, long period, uh, you know, strap lake back. We were never we were using any groundwater. We use, weren't using any water. I'm not sure how they got. To, I mean, this point here is is their estimate of. Uh, Started at 126 cubic kilometers of, of water being used per year. Um, it's actually uh, groundwater depletion in this curve. So depletion means that, that you've removed water from the aquifer and it's not been recharged. So why does this depletion happen? Um, Looking over here on the right side, if you just focus on the bottom right, freshwater use, this is consumptive 
water use, meaning you use the water and it does not, it does not um, go back into the system. So for example, a, a non-consumptive use would be something like um, you know, a power plant uses water for cooling. Use the, use the water from the river, use it for cooling, water goes back in the river warmer, but you still have water. Um, a consumptive use would be something like irrigation, where you pump the water out of the ground or take it from a, a, a river, you apply it on the surface, and most of that water evaporates and it's, and it's gone. So, uh, so when you look at the freshwater consumptive use, um, you know, domestic and other industrials, only 7%, 93% is, is agriculture. So if you want to worry about you know, you know, groundwater depletion around the world, aquifer depletion, you know, the big issue is, is agriculture. Uh, and this is a paper that, that came out a few years ago in, in Nature looking at the, uh, uh, the different types of, or different, you know, sort of putting in the different sources of groundwater depletion. Um, this, this chart in the upper left shows the different, um, different crops um, as well as the uh, groundwater depletion um, represented by the size of the circle here. And then on the right is the global trade in uh, agricultural commodities. And so it shows, uh, for example, over the USA, um, this is all water that we're, virtual water that we're exporting to other parts of the world. We use this water, um, this groundwater to grow crops, then send those crops to, to another part of the world. Um, so we're essentially sending our water other places. We do get water back. We get quite a bit of water back from from Mexico, but overall, the net for, for the U.S. is that we're, we're shipping a lot of groundwater uh, internationally. And you can see there's, uh, it's interesting to see that, that Pakistan is one of the other biggest exporters of water. Uh, India is also a big exporter. But um, pretty interesting to see uh, these different, different um, contributions to, to groundwater depletion um, actually coming from across borders. Okay, so let's talk about large-scale groundwater science. Uh, if we're going to study groundwater, how do we get our information? Um, in the 20th century, it was um, almost completely reliant on in-situ observations, sort of like the observations that I was telling you that I did uh, in New Jersey. Uh, you might install a groundwater well with a drill, um, take drill logs, so you know the type of material, you know where the aquifer and the aquitards are, um, and then you, then you make measurements. Um, how deep is the water? And you can do this, you, know, you can automate those measurements, but still requires quite a bit of effort to install the system and then monitor, maintain it, that sort of thing. Um, there are other tools like ground penetrating radars, not used all that often. And then the models, um, as you can imagine, you know, pre-2000, the models were, were not as advanced as they are now. We didn't have as uh, powerful computers as we do. So the modeling was, was somewhat simplistic. You can still do some, some decent science, though, with, with in-situ observations. This is a paper that Bai Ling Li, who's, who's uh, an Essex scientist, published um, five years ago. And we used data from, from um, uh, groundwater monitoring wells around the US. Um, there's some pretty decent data in the Mississippi River Basin and, and Pennsylvania and other parts of the eastern US. And you can do things like the upper Mississippi here. Um, you can come up with a time series of, of groundwater. So the, the orange lines in the middle here um, show the, so all, all the time series from all these wells in this region. And then the mean is the black line in the middle. And so you can see things like major drought in 1988, 1989 shows up in the groundwater. And then where there's flooding in that part of the world um, in about 1993. And you can see that you know, there's a lot of precipitation, groundwater increases. So um, you get a pretty decent result uh, doing things like this, but it's difficult. You know, there's not a lot of data, and then you have to you have to comb through the data that are available for this study. We had to look for wells that were not directly affected by pumping or injections. We wanted wells that were in a installed in a um, unconfined or semi-confined aquifer because if you get data from a confined aquifer, it really doesn't. Um, it, it's basically groundwater head. It's it's uh, it represents the pressure in the aquifer, which is not easily uh, translated into a change in, in storage. Um, wanted to get at least four depth of water measurements per year and a minimum 10-year record. So when you do that, you, you eliminate you know, hundreds of wells. Um, 
There are a lot more wells than what, what are shown here in these regions, but, but this is what's left when you apply these criteria. In general, you know, surface observations are, are pretty inadequate for a lot of our purposes. So upper right, or sorry, upper left here is the global telecommunication system, and these are meteorological stations. They're important for weather forecasting. Um, the, the variables they measure are air temperature, precipitation, soil radiation, wind speed, and humidity, and that's pretty much it. And you get, you, know, you get good coverage like you expect in a lot of the more developed, wealthier parts of the world, but then you go someplace like northern Africa, and these, uh, these dots are, are pretty far apart from each other. You, know, you lose one station, suddenly you're interpolating across hundreds of kilometers. Uh, if we look at the, um, uh, on the lower left here shows uh, data from the Global Runoff Data Center, which is sort of the, the world's um, repository for, uh, for river flow, stream flow runoff data. And what the dots mean here, um, dots are the locations, but if it's, a, if it's a dark blue dot, that means there's data available from maybe last year or more recently. If it's a yellow or red dot, that means you know, the, the warmer the color, the longer, longer ago it was since we actually had data from, from these, um, these locations. So for example, uh, the Nile River, one of the most well-known and, and important rivers in the world, um, you can't get data past 1983. Egypt doesn't want to share those data. Um, then coming back to groundwater here, uh, this is the USGS uh, Groundwater Climate Response Network. So they've sort of tried to, to uh, pare down all the, the hundreds or thousands of stations that they have and come up with a handful of, or, or, you know, really a handful, a lot of stations um, where you have a, a good combination of a long time series and the data are, are, are not affected by things like pumping. Um, and um, so, you know, it's pretty dense in the eastern U.S., um, but you come out here to, to the west and, and you know, there's pretty big gaps between, between some of these wells. It's even worse at the global scale. So this is the global groundwater monitoring network in the upper right. And you can see that, um, you know, there's some places where there, there are a lot of wells. Um, a lot of wells there will contribute the data to this, this clearinghouse, which is sort of like the groundwater version of the global runoff data center. Um, and then a lot of places where you can't get any data. So a lot of places where there's just no groundwater data at all. And then beyond that, it's also not as easy to get access to these data as, as we would like because the data providers don't necessarily make them freely available. They want to have some sort of a, an agreement with end users or they want to be on your papers, which is fine. But um, not as easy to get those data as it is to get the, the runoff data. So uh, that was 20th century. 21st century, um, we've got some additional tools, uh, remote sensing. So I'll talk about satellite gravi gravimetry. That's uh, GRACE mission and, and related missions. Um, INSAR, synthetic aperture radar, is also a sort of up and coming technology that may be able to provide us um, information that will be useful for groundwater monitoring in the near future. We also have um, improving uh, numerical models, and we have um, you know, coupling those with the atmosphere and data simulation and that sort of thing. So this is NASA's current fleet of Earth observing missions. And I'm going to circle the ones that are, that are relevant for hydrology. Um, a lot of important ones. You probably know quite a bit about GPM, global precipitation measurement, that's one of the key missions for hydrology. Also circled up here is, is GRACE follow-on. I'll talk some more about that. So monitoring groundwater with GRACE and GRACE follow-on. So uh, a little background here. Um, most Earth observing missions are basically measuring emitted or reflected wavelengths of light. The EM spectrum here and, and different wavelengths are useful for, for uh, observing different variables, but you're limited in this type of observation that, you, that none of these measurements penetrate the ground below the first few centimeters. And maybe with a future P-band radar, you get down to a meter, but you'd really not be able to use this information for, for uh, groundwater uh, monitoring. Um, GRACE and GRACE follow-on are different. So GRACE was a mission launched in 2002, went until 2017. Follow-on launched in, uh, in 2018. And these, these missions are unique because they're not sort of looking down. They're actually measuring the orbits. There's two satellites, one following the other, and they're basically uh, 
uh, basically monitoring each other and, uh, and using that information to come up with a map of Earth's gravity field. Gravity changes from month to month. We can then use that to infer changes in, in the terrestrial water storage. Um, and it's not limited by, not limited by depth. So the, the total uh, you know, down to the base of the deepest aquifer is what you can measure. The way this works is these two satellites are basically free floating around the Earth. They're, they start out about 485 kilometers altitude, about two, 200 kilometers apart from each other. And, uh, and they have a K-band um, microwave ranging system. And what this does is every five seconds, they measure that 200 kilometer distance uh, with a precision down to a micron, which is about the size of a, a red blood cell. So you have this extremely precise measurement of this of this inner satellite range. And what happens is over time, things might uh, move over a mass anomaly. So imagine a mountain range. There's more mass there. Gravity's directly related to the amount of mass. So if there's a mountain range, there's more gravitational pull. And what happens is this first satellite sort of gets pulled forward a little faster. And the separation between the satellites increases. And you're monitoring this thing every five seconds down to the micron. And, you, and you this, as you start to pass over the mountain range, the first satellite's held back, the second satellite's pulled forward, and they catch up, and this distance becomes smaller, and then things equal out um, later on. Um, so, so doing that, you're able to detect that, hey, there was a mass anomaly there. But these, these measurements are so precise and, uh, and so frequent that over the course of a month, um, you can make a new map of the gravity field that incorporates not this, just these static gravity anomalies, things that aren't changing, it actually uh, changes in the gravity field. Why would the gravity field change? If you think about um, some major things are like atmospheric circulation. So, so uh, when you make a measurement of the, the surface pressure, that's basically a measurement of, of the mass of the atmosphere above you. And so the, there's a lot of mass moving around the atmosphere, and that actually affects um, uh, the, the gravity field and, and just, just the satellites. Same thing with ocean circulation, ocean tides. It's huge amounts of, of mass moving around. That affect the satellites. And then the other thing over land is that if, imagine you have a big rainfall event. You, know, you get an inch of rain over Maryland. Think about how much mass that is. You take an inch of rain over all of Maryland, it, it's a huge amount of mass. It's enough mass that, that actually affects the orbits of these satellites in a predictable way. And we can, we can recover that and infer um, basically the, the amount of mass there have had to been. To, uh, to cause the, to the, uh, the orbits of the satellites to change the way they did. Um, so when we do this, we come up with, uh, with these monthly maps of uh, terrestrial water storage anomalies. So what we do is we, we, we have models that integrate measurements of, of atmospheric, um, uh, atmospheric dynamics, and, and, and um, they come up with an estimate of atmospheric mass, ocean models, ocean circulation models that we can use to, to model the ocean mass. And uh, basically, we can strip off those components. And what's left is just the, the, uh, the terrestrial water storage. Showing these as um, anomalies, so, uh, so mean zero. So you take your long-term mean. In this case, I think we used 2005 to 2009, um, sort of arbitrary. But you, take this, you take this mean, and then you look at the, uh, um, the, the mass um, of the terrestrial water storage at a given location relative to that long-term mean for the same location. So, so if it's a blue, that means it's, it's, uh, it's wetter than normal. If it's a red, that means it's, it's drier than normal. And these are centimeters. Yeah, this is uh, centimeters equivalent height of water. Right, yep. Right, so the left um, is, the, is sort of the total terrestrial water storage anomaly. Um, and you can see that, that during the seasons, you know, for example, in Maryland, it's going to be wetter in the spring and drier in the fall. Um, but if you, if you remove that mean seasonal cycle, um, then you, can, you get the result on the right, which is the non-seasonal terrestrial water storage anomaly. And that's interesting because it tells you something about, you know, is it wetter than or, or drier than normal a particular time of year? So that's, that's what you want to look at if you're interested in things like, like drought and, and groundwater depletion. Um, another thing we can do is, uh, is, is after we remove the seasonal cycle from the time series, we can then fit a linear trend at each location. 
and come up with a map of, of apparent trends in terrestrial water storage. So this is for the period 2002 to 2016. <clears throat> this is, these are the, um, the trends that we compute um, uh, based, on, based on the GRACE data. So there are areas that are blue where water storage on average was increasing. Red areas where water storage on average was, was decreasing. And the question here is which of these apparent trends are really just natural interannual variability? which may be caused by water mismanagement, things like you know, pumping too much water out of the aquifers faster than it can recharge, and which may be associated with, with climate change. So, um, so we look at the nat natural interannual variability first. One of the, one of the you know, things you want to compare with is what happened with precipitation during the same time period. So um, left is the terrestrial water storage trends from GRACE. Top right is the precipitation. Um, percentage of normals for, for the, the grace period, 2002 to 2016. And then um, the lower right is the precipitation trends during the, the same period. You can see that there's some areas where um, the precipitation increased by one or the other of the metrics. And we also see um, an increase in, in uh, terrestrial water storage. Similarly, there are areas where where the precipitation was, was decreasing or was lower than normal during that period, and we see a decrease in terrestrial water storage. So it's likely in these areas that, that the natural interannual variability explains all or at least part of the terrestrial water storage parent trends that we see. If we look at, um, we want to look at climate change, we, we're going to make use of the, uh, uh, the high end. Uh, predicted change of precipitation that I showed you before. That's on the right now. And, um, and basically you see that, that um, a lot of areas are expecting, um, especially high latitude areas, there's a predicted increase in precipitation. And we're maybe beginning to see some of the uh, signs that there are also increases in terrestrial water storage. This is um, something that sort of bears watching and similarly um, places where precipitation is predicted to decrease, and we see decreases in, uh, in terrestrial water storage in some of those places. This is not a smoking gun. This is not like, hey, climate change is definitely happening here. But this is like, these are areas where, okay, we should continue to monitor here because if, if this bears out as we, as we get into the GRACE follow-on period, if we continue to see the same trends in these locations, um, you know, and of course, if you see Precipitation data might show the same thing, then that's going to start to give us some confidence that some of these predicted trends may be coming true. Yeah, so, so in Antarctica, interesting because precipitation is predicted to increase almost everywhere, but also the warming, especially this part of the ice sheet, is where, where most of the uh, um, depletion and ablation of the ice sheet is happening, uh, slipping into the ocean. So this, yeah, it's hard to tell because these, water, these, these numbers saturate out here, but just take my word for it, this red is a, is a much bigger um, loss than, this, than this, uh, this blue gain is here. Right, so there may be there may be more precipitation ever. I mean, it's hard to separate these you know, these factors here. But there may be more precipitation happening everywhere. But there's also a lot more ice sheet loss uh, in these regions, so that the net is a, is a is a major loss of terrestrial water storage in the form of ice. Yeah. 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 Yes, uh, the blues are water storage increase. Yeah. So not everywhere. Oh, that, in the in the U.S. So so that was predicted. So that's saying you know 100 years you know end of this century, if there's four degrees of warming, then. That paper only was was considering um, uh, vapor transpiration. Um, yeah, but if you look at the predictions for for uh, changes in precipitation, there's 
you know, it's not a big change in the central U.S. where they were they were looking at. I mean, I agree with you. It's not it's not co completely. Um, you know, they they don't have every variable, but they're they're basically saying if we just look at the warming component and how that affects evaporation. Um, in, the, in the ocean, eventually. Well, that's part of the reason you have sea level rise. That's why there's sea level rise, yeah. <laughs> okay, so finally, uh, the water sort of mismanagement here. Um, on the right, I'm showing a map of percentage of irrigated area. Um, and you can see there are areas like, uh, like Indy where they use uh, you know, huge fraction of the land surface is, is irrigated, likewise in the North China Plain, but also you see in the U.S. are several areas where um, there's quite a bit of irrigation going on. And if we compare that to uh, what we see in the terrestrial water storage trends, there's definitely some areas that, that line up pretty closely in terms of uh, uh, terrestrial water storage depletion. You can, you can interpret that most of that terrestrial water storage depletion is going to be groundwater depletion. Um, and, and clearly, it's uh, it's uh, well correlated and aligned with this with this irrigation uh, water use. Also interesting that um, see this increase here in in sort of central China, um, and that's associated with uh, filling of the three gorges and other reservoirs. So they build these big dams on big rivers, fill up the reservoir, and if you calculate the mass of water that's stored behind the reservoir, it's, it is enough um, to cause uh, the trend that's show, shown here. So, so it's obvious the statistics. It's, it's what? Can you prove the statistics? Well, it's 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 sort of. The, the, yes, it, it's consistent in terms of the in terms of the magnitude. Is that is that your question? Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so focusing on one of these. These areas um, that we studied in, uh, in northern India. Uh, this is the time series of, um, of the terrestrial water storage anomalies. <coughs> excuse me, from the Grace data. And you see this long-term trend. There are, there are some ups and downs here. And actually, we've removed the seasonal cycle from this, so this is just the non-seasonal trend. There's some ups and downs, but generally the, the direction is down. And we estimate that the terrestrial water storage depletion rate, this pretty large region which supports a lot of the country with agriculture, um, is about 19 cubic kilometers of water per year. So to put that into context, uh, the largest surface water reservoir in the U.S. is, is uh, Lake Mead. That holds about 30 or 35 cubic kilometers of water. So. Every two years, they're using using up more than a, a Lake Mead worth of uh, of groundwater from this this region. And again, this is scary because um, the agriculture in this region uh, supports um, a lot of the people in this second most populated country in the world. Um, and incidentally, um, when we published that result in two thousand nine. A lot of people were surprised by it, and a lot of people didn't realize the, the extent of this issue, even though there was sort of anecdotal evidence that the water levels were dropping in the aquifers. But it wasn't because there weren't data um, at least collected. Uh, this is um, a map of groundwater observation wells. So all these tiny dots are observation wells uh, where data are collected by the, the Indian government. The data were not made available at the time, and so um, People do not have a good handle on on the extent of the issue. Now they start to, you know, now they're aware. <coughs> there are a lot of studies that have come out since then, and um, there have actually been some changes in policy, which is really positive. Because one of the reasons for this depletion is because um, uh, back in the late 1960s, uh, India started their their green revolution. They wanted to be able to, to feed their people, so they started using Western um, agricultural practices like like pumping groundwater, and also um, uh, using uh, you know, chemical fertilizers. Um, they actually gave, uh, in a lot of these regions, they gave farmers free electricity to pump as much water out of the ground as they wanted to to irrigate their crops because they wanted to you know, uh, enable them to 
to grow as you know, much as they could. Um, of course, that's a good incentive for people to to dewater aquifers, right? You just keep pumping and pumping because there's there's no reason to stop. You know your neighbor's pumping water, so I better pump it you know, before it's gone, and um, and that's what's been happening for quite a while. But they are starting to at least discuss, you know, um, making changes to that sort of policy to to uh, preserve their groundwater resources. <laughs> It, yes, this is not global warming. This is clearly uh, pumping groundwater for, for irrigating crops, yes. So this map um, uh, we published two years ago in Nature, it shows the, the global trend map again. And we've gone and we circled the major trends in different parts of the world and attempt, attempted to explain um, their causes. It's a little hard to see, but down here in the lower left, um, we've, we've categorized them as in, in, into uh, Probable climate change impacts, possible climate change impacts, probable direct human impacts, possible direct human impacts, and, uh, and probable natural variability. Um, so we have Grace follow on now, and we'll see, you know, in 10, 20 years, we'll see how many of these we were right on. Um, maybe some of them were, we interpret things wrongly. Um, but uh, we also include a table in this. In this um, in this paper, where we we estimate the the, uh, the rates of the terrestrial water storage changes, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, so so this is um, actually predicted that there will be uh, more precipitation there. So it's possible, you know, is possible a climate change impact. I would say, you know. We put that as possible. It could just as easily be, um, you know, just sort of natural variability. Um, but there was one paper that came out uh, a year or two ago on, uh, on groundwater rejuvenation in, in India, where they were theorizing that these policy changes, people pumping less water, has actually led to um, some additional recharge. But I think that you know, it still requires um, more time and more data before we can. We can sort of disentangle those different hypotheses and come up with an actual uh, real theory. Um, yeah. Wh where? In the U.S. Well, you have the negative trend here. Well, no, this is this is uh, Texas and the high, the southern part of the High Plains aquifer. So that makes sense, but this is mostly drought well, here in, in Texas. Plain. Yeah, the, 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 the Great Plains. Yeah. Well, this one is. I, I don't expect a lot of groundwater pumping in that area, so that's. You know, we wouldn't expect to be depleting groundwater there. They've got enough water. Um, you know, surface water, they don't really need to deplete their aquifers. But I would say this is natural variability. And, and over time, we may find that um, you know, maybe it's natural variability, maybe it's, maybe it's a climate change. But, but our hypothesis was that the just sort of natural variations, it was wetter in, you know, towards the end of the 2002 to 2016 period than it was in the beginning. And that's why you see this anticipated trend. Yeah. Yeah, but sixteen years is still a short period, right? Well, I and so, well, yeah. I mean, the southern high plains is going to have some problems. The northern high plains happen to be wet during this period, but I, I don't think you should interpret that as, yeah, it's going to be wet for the next sixteen years. You know, I think. Um, it's it's gonna it's gonna have some variation over time. Yeah, Ahmed. Yeah. 
true. It's it's possible, but um, but I know that they've been getting you know the, there's a lot of, water, a lot of water that that recharges the High Plains Aquifer in Nebraska where they have these sand hills and and water recharges very quickly, and, uh, and what we've seen is you know relatively stable groundwater levels there over the longer period, but the southern High Plains is where you've had the wells drying up, and that's mainly it's just you know it's, it's drier, it's warmer, people pump more water. And um, and there's less recharge, so yeah, it's hard hard to really speculate on how much you know state to state regulation. I mean, they will have an effect over a long period, but I don't think we can tease that out with this sort of course resolution information. Okay, move on here. Um, so let me talk a little bit about drought west wetness uh, monitoring and forecasting. Um, to do this, we make use of a land surface model. So one thing that was implied that didn't actually say was that the grace observations are very coarse. Uh, so the smallest area you can resolve at mid-latitudes with grace is about 150,000 square kilometers, about the size of the state of Illinois. So I can't tell, use grace or grace follow on to tell you anything about what's going on in your backyard aquifer. Um, these are all you know coarse level observations. Um, they're also somewhat delayed. We usually don't get data from grace or grace following until a few months after the, the observation. Um, that's not very good for, for uh, operational applications. So one of the things we can do is integrate the data within a land surface model. The land surface model is sort of like the, uh, the land component of a weather or climate um, forecasting model. Uh, it typically divides the world up into a, a grid, and then there might be subgrid um, variability. And at each location, it models simulates basically what happens um, with water, you know, precipitation and, and solar radiation after they hit the land surface. Uh, so you're going to have things like you know, runoff, you're going to have evapotranspiration, you're going to have some infiltration of the water, um, uh, the, the solar radiation is going to heat up the land surface, it's going to drive evapotranspiration, and it's going to be reflected back. So all of these processes um, including processes within the vegetation are, are simulated by these land surface models. And, uh, and for each location, able to come up with, with estimates of some of these, these important fluxes and storages like, like soil moisture. So this is just showing you what some of the inputs are. There's, there's static parameters like vegetation and soil type and elevation. Input forcings in the lower left, are the, the things that we get from uh, either observations or a weather analysis model that, that drive the land surface model forward in the future because the model itself is not predictive. It's not like a climate model that can just run off to the future. It needs these inputs um, in order to, to go forward in time. Um, and then we can also assimilate data. And that what that means, if you don't know much about assimilation, is, for example, if you have a soil moisture observation from SMAP, SMAP gives you an estimate of the soil moisture in a location. The model gives you an estimate, and then you use um, um, so numerical techniques come up with sort of an optimal um, estimate of the soil moisture, um, taking into account that there's errors in both of your original estimates. So we can we can assimilate these different types of data. The top one here that's blanked out is terrestrial water storage. Um, we come up with that you know a range of outputs that are that are more useful in a lot of cases than than the original inputs themselves. So we do this um, uh, with the GRACE data. This is just an example. Um, May 2014, so here's what the GRACE yield looks like for May 2014. Simulate that into our land surface model, combine it with other information like the precipitation, solar radiation, et cetera, and they come up with these higher resolution maps, things like surface soil moisture, roots on soil moisture, and groundwater, which we then further converted to, uh, to percentiles. Um, so basically, how wet is it at a given location for the same time of year relative to a, to a long period. So we go back to 1948. Uh, so, so if it's red, so let's say it's uh, second percentile here, the dark red, that means that at this particular location and time of year, it's only been that dry 2% of the time in our, in our data record. Likewise, if it's 98th percentile, it's only been that wet 2% uh, of the time in our, in our data record. And you can compare these with the U.S. Drought Monitor product, which you can find in the back of the USA Today, it's sort of the premier uh, drought product for the U.S. And uh, pretty good comparison. Part of that might be because we now these are now uh, inputs uh, to the U.S. Drought Monitor, but they use a lot of different other inputs. Um, 
we've been doing that for a while. And one of the new things we're doing now is um, coming up with drought and wetness forecasts. So the way we do that is we run the data simulating model, we simulate the grace and grace follow-on data. And then we drive the model three months in the future using downscaled uh, seasonal forecasts that come from NASA's uh, GEOS-5 seasonal forecast system. So um, the left here is showing the, the, the left column is the groundwater forecast. Um, the right column is a root zone soil moisture forecast for both for one, two, and three months into the future. And then this, the, the uh, right is going to show our, our uh, outputs from a model at that time. So this is the output simulating all the data after we have it on July 1st. You can see we do a particularly good job. Uh, the groundwater, the forecast groundwater on July 1st, which is a month into the future, looks pretty much like the groundwater analysis, the groundwater that, uh, that actually happened. We go two months in the future, still look pretty good with the groundwater. Uh, soil moisture, you can see it was a little wetter than we expected it to be in a, in a lar large part of the central U.S. And then three months out, you know, we still have general patterns are pretty good with the groundwater analysis. Again, it was it was wetter than the model predicted. Um, and then likewise with the soil moisture, we'll get some some of the same um, general patterns if you squint, but uh, far from perfect. But um, but given that there really aren't any good drought and wetness monitoring products out there, at least we're we're providing um, something that's fairly useful. Um, Shows some skill, and this is a um, this is a published in a paper that Augusto Guitarana um, just just had published uh, this year. It was a uh, Essex scientist. Um, we also do the uh, Grace Grace follow follow on data simulation at the global scale now. Um, the top left here shows the uh, the model open loop, which means we're not assimilating any data. Um, the top right is the is the Grace uh, Truster Water Storage. And then the um, um, the bottom right is the uh, the assimilated result. All these are the non-seasonal, so it's basically showing the uh, the relative wetness or dryness for that particular location and, and time of year. Use those and convert them into uh, the drought uh, wetness percentiles, just like we did before. So we're now coming up with global drought um, and wetness uh, monitoring maps. These are just an example from uh, from December um, for soil moisture in the upper left. Surface soil moisture, root zone soil moisture in the lower left, and groundwater in the lower right. Um, and this is a paper that, that Bai Ling Li um, just had published uh, end of last year. Um, if you compare them, there aren't very many global maps of, of, for drought monitoring. Um, this is one in the upper right here that you can find online. If you look, if you compare you know, our estimates with what, what was in um, this other map, which is basically uh, based on uh, uh, precipitation index, not much else. Um, you see that there's pretty good uh, correspondence, which gives us some confidence that we're, we're doing things right. And these maps and the forecasts are going to be provided on the National Drought Mitigation website, National Drought Mitigation Center website, um, starting in just a couple weeks. Yeah. Um, these forcing data are, are from the ECMWF analysis, um, which we said, uh, luckily we have this proprietary access to the ECMWF analysis that we set up about 15 years ago and we're still making use of it. So here's my summary. I think I've gone a little bit over time. Um, so if you want to read that while I answer questions and um, appreciate your attention. Thank you. It's a really interesting talk. Thanks a lot. Um, you talk a lot about uh, climate change and uh, water change. I wonder, you know, you have a that map showing where you have a deficit, uh, where we have a surplus based on the grid observation. And later, you show the model result. It's kind of weather type of, uh, you know, uh, groundwater. If you can run the climate model, and if the climate model for the hydrology is good enough, then you can probably subtract uh, what the climate change will, will cause um, the change in the groundwater without uh, the human-induced you know, climate change. And then you can just highlight 
take the difference for that, highlight where are the human induced uh, water change for that map. Is that doable? So um, I, I think we could, uh, we could do something like you're talking about to, if we downscale the climate model, your outputs, use those to force our model, you know, right. decades into the future, we come up with estimates of, of uh, you know, climate change impacts on, on groundwater. I don't know if that's, um, I don't know if any of the models are good enough uh, to, to do sort of a, an analysis now of climate change impacts, you know, current climate change impacts, I, I don't think, um, I don't think I would necessarily trust them because we don't really know right now, it's hard to even say right now what's, What's the climate change impact on, on precipitation, for example? Yes, but I do not mean just the future projection. I also mean in the past 16 years. Well, that's what I'm can... saying. It's, I think it's hard in the past 16 years to, to say what, what, was the, you know, what were the climate change impacts on precipitation, for example, in the right. last uh, 16 years. I mean, you could do it with, with temperature, and that's sort of what um, the study I showed by Laura Condon was, was doing. You know, if there's a, if there's a temperature change, they could do the same thing with you know historic temperature change. You know what would be the impacts on evapotranspiration? How would that how would that change the, uh, the groundwater? So it, it's an interesting concept. Uh, can you clarify? Does is any correlation between sea level rise and changes of Groundwater. I always cannot understand how. Yeah, uh, and there was a paper that uh, J.T. Rager et al. published in uh, Science a few years ago, um, where they basically tried to come up with estimates of of how much of current sea level rise is caused by um, caused by uh, groundwater extractions, and um, it's it's a small but not not negligible component of it. I forget what the actual number was, but it's you know. It may be something like five or ten percent of the of the sea level rise is related to, um, to groundwater depletion in different parts of the world. A few generation or PCC reports, it was attempt to explain all sea level rise by uh, pumping water from continent, mining water from continent. So it is uh, certainly it was mistaken. It was wrong. It, now it is probably even forgotten, but uh, oh, interesting! Uh, interesting. If you can see something, you observe it. Yeah, I understand the answer. Yeah, no, it's hard to, um, you know, the gray state. It doesn't really separate for you. You know, what part of the sea level rise is uh, is caused by groundwater depletion versus the you know ice sheet losses. Um, you know, that's up to, to scientists to sort out. But um, but I I can say that. Um, that there is a component of the sea level rise that is caused by the groundwater extractions. It's it's a small component, but it's not negligible. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Vlad, let's uh, ramp up and thank the speaker again. Thanks, everyone. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah.